Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Compassion Consortium. We have some feathered friends today. Welcome to the toucans. Take a few breaths, perhaps close your eyes. Thank you, toucans. I put them this month as my alarm on my phone. So every time I wake up, I hear toucans now. My cats are not amused. So welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Compassion Consortium Sunday service. I'm Reverend Sarah Bowen, and I'm joined today by co-founders Victoria Moran, Reverend William Milton, and Reverend Erica Allison, who I'd like to congratulate for recently winning a Nautilus Award for her book, Gay the Pray Away, Healing Your Life, Love, and Relationships from the Harms of LGBT Conversion Therapy. Well done and well-deserved, Erica. And as always, we are grateful that Phil is busy steering us through Zoomtopia today. We meet for Sunday service, the fourth Sunday of every month. We hope to see you often. If you're near to us, welcome. We are an interfaith, interspiritual, and interspecies community. Interfaith means we welcome people of any spiritual or religious tradition, philosophy, path, system of meaning making, and we feature these within our program. So today we'll hear from Lydia Houston about a modern path based on the text A Course in Miracles. Interspiritual means that we believe underneath all of these wisdom traditions, there lies a deeper unity of shared experience and a commitment to three common values, peace, compassionate service, and love for all creation. So we endeavor to touch each of those values in our service today. And finally, our community is interspecies, which means we desire to have a truly inclusive spiritual community that goes beyond human superiority and exclusivism to consider the needs of the many species that we all share the planet with. Today, I'm speaking to you from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. You heard me right, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Prior to 1950, this town was called Hot Springs because there's a lot of hot springs and I have really been enjoying them. But when Ralph Edwards, the host of a popular NBC radio quiz show, that was called Truth or Consequences, announced that he would air his 10th anniversary of the show from the first town to rename themselves. Promotional genius, right? Well, Hot Springs officially changed its name, and the program was broadcast from here the following evening. Edwards then visited TRC, as it's called in short form, during the first weekend of May for the next 50 years. The event became known as a fiesta, and eventually included a beauty contest, a parade featuring the Miss Fiesta pageant queen and the winner of the Hatch Chili Queen pageant, Hatch is a town down the road, and a stage show. But well before the city of TRC or Hot Springs was here, this was the land cherished by the Mescalero Apache and the Piro. This is the land of mountain lions and bison, of black hawks and golden eagles, of elf owls and the curve build thrashers. New Mexico is an intriguing area of the US to me because while its terrain often feels oppressively hot, my God, it's been hot and unhospitable. The people I meet here are incredibly friendly, multicultural and connected to their habitats in a way I don't often see where I live. The history of this area is fraught with political and cultural struggles including the not so distant tragedy of the American Indian residential schools, which were designed to wipe out the identities of First Nations people. Deb Holland, the Department of the Interior Secretary now, recently reflected the languages, the cultures, religions, traditional practices, and even the history of Native communities. All of it was targeted for destruction. Human attempts to wipe out identities are not something of the past either, are they? We all have a front row seat to the current war over Ukrainian identity. And at home, we see plenty of identities that are dominated by others. 
And some of you in the Compassion Consortium community are deeply involved in issues, many people around the, many issues that people around the world face, whose communities are collapsing because of agribusiness. For example, we see disastrous practices happening in Brazil, where land privatization and nature commodification ignore indigenous rights in the name of grabbing more land for cattle grazing, as well as for growing sugarcane and for soybeans. None of this is good news for human animals. And it's not good news for other than human ones. And I want to show you why. This is a map from Terralingua, which I find endlessly fascinating. It charts language diversity in correlation to biodiversity. And what becomes quite clear very quickly is that areas that have a lot of languages, those are the black dots that you see, those are languages, also have a lot of plant diversity, which correlates to animal diversity. So the darker green areas, and if you don't see the colors, um, if you have color differences in the way you see, let me know, I'll email you a copy in grayscale. Um, but that we see the places that have a lot of languages also have that plant diversity. And strikingly, since 1970, there's been a 20% decline in global linguistic diversity, which means people who speak less dominant languages have dropped them to speak more dominant ones, like English and Mandarin, Hindi, Spanish, French, Arabic, due to pressures from dominant cultures. With this erosion of linguistic diversity comes the erosion of traditional environmental knowledge, which has helped sustain habitats and teach respect for nature for millennia. We also see a similar decline in biodiversity loss over this time. So the two seem correlated. There's a parallel violation of human rights and nature rights. So we have a converging extinction crisis. So Terralingua observes that when we create monocultures of the mind through globalization, wanting everyone to think the same way or act the same way, it has the same effect as creating monocultures in farming. It makes our planet more fragile and vulnerable to natural disasters and, hum and human-made crises. So biocultural diversity conservation, that's the term today. Wrap your tongue around that for a second biocultural diversity conservation matters from an individualistic community societal planetary viewpoints it's critical for all of our survival nature and human cultures are inextricably intertwined helping animals means helping people and threatened cultures to survive especially in the areas where they're integral for preserving biodiversity so here's the message i hope i've unearthed today for you for all of us to think about as we go through our service and perhaps into our discussion. Let's get really curious about what we consume and use in a way we might not have thought about yet. Where do the food we eat and the products we use come from? Now, the majority of us here obviously observe plant-based diets in order to reduce animal suffering. But do we know where those plants come from? And do we know the practices used to create our food? Are those methods kind to local populations? The people producing them? The wild beings living in that area? Do they, do they grab land? Are they sustainable? If you have the luxury of eating locally grown food, you can probably figure that out pretty easily. Just go to where your food is created and ask some questions. If you live in a food desert or you have to rely on processed food, it might be more difficult, but I think it's still worth some inquiry. So to wrap it up, these observations today are not made to discourage us, to shame us, to depress us, but to help us in our quest to live into this community's tenets of agreements. As we know, spreading compassion doesn't just mean choosing what stays off our plates and out of our closets. It also means consistently asking questions about the things we may take for granted. When we live in a state of curiosity, we're more likely to understand the truth and the consequences of each of our species' actions. But I'm bump. Over to you, William. We always start our spiritual service with a reading of our tenets of agreement. These are the principles upon which the Confession Consortium is founded. And they're very serious to us. We don't just read them 
to be reading them. It's very, very important to us. And so today, our reader is Sue Sullivan. Sue is a master level registered expressive arts therapist in Massachusetts, specializing in work with trauma survivors. And her recent clinical findings have led her to the hypothesis that even subconscious knowledge of the implicit cruelty involved in an omnivorous lifestyle can impede healing from past trauma. Who is also a vegan lifestyle coach and educator, certified through the Main Street Vegan Academy. So now, Sue, I'm going to turn this over to you to read our Tenants of Agreement. Thank you, Will. And I just want to thank the Compassion Consortium for the opportunity to read these gorgeous tenants. It's a huge honor. Number one, we acknowledge a divine force at the heart of the universe and in all living beings. You may refer to this force as God, but it is known by many names and appears in different forms or as formless. Number two, we recognize the common moral principles inherent within all wisdom traditions. Number three, we affirm that compassion, reverence for life, and nonviolence are fundamental to religious faith and moral philosophy and are to be extended to all sentient beings. Number four, we stand by the principles of inclusion, diversity, and equality and hold these essential in our human relations. Number five, we hold that non-human animals are imbued with the same essence of life and love as our human animals, and that there is a moral parity between us. Number six, we avow that humans do not own the earth, its resources or inhabitants, but instead must be involved in their protection and care. Number seven, we endeavor to eat and live in a kind and sustainable manner, moving away from animal foods and animal derived clothing, as well as any activities that cause harm to our fellow beings, human or otherwise. Number eight, we aim to provide spiritual comfort, fellowship and food for thought to all of those practicing or exploring a vegan lifestyle. Number nine, we offer guidance and peer support for all of those seeking a more compassionate and spiritual life. And number 10, we commit to sharing the principles freely with humility and respect in support of non-human animals and the earth. Thank you very much, Sue. So, now is when we do our Song of Compassion. And today's Song of Compassion is Room at, Room at the Table by Carrie Newcomer. And this was suggested by one of the members of our community, Kay Sanders. And so let me tell you about this song. Carrie Newcomer, she's a songwriter, recording artist, performer, and educator. She's been described as a prairie mystic by the Boston Globe and one who asks all the right questions by Rolling Stone magazine. She has 19 nationally released albums and has recent appearances on PBS Religion and Ethics and Krista Tippett's On Being. And in 2009 and 2011, she was invited by the American Embassy of India to be a cultural ambassador resulting in her interfaith benefit album, Everything is Everywhere with Master of the Indian Sarod, Amjad Ali Khan. So I just wanna go off script and say, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I have never before been familiar with Carrie's music. But then again, I kind of stopped listening to new music after Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell. So that was just kind of where I was in my life. So as I said, this song was suggested by Kay Sanders, a member of our community, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Ooh. 
Let our hearts not be hearted To those living on the margins There is room at the table For everyone This is where it all begins This is how we gather in There is room at the table For everyone For too long we have wandered Burdened and undone But there is room at the table For everyone Let us sing the new world in This is how it all begins so much and for that song suggestion. We love to get song suggestions, so bring them our way. Uh, welcome everyone, so happy you're here. We're, it's time for us to dive into a, an interspecies spiritual practice. We're gonna spend a few months, a few minutes now dropping into our own practice and getting in touch with our inner self. And it's perfect that the last image in Carrie Newcomer's video was that adorable little being with the, the heart-shaped sunglasses because today's meditation is going to be an inner child meditation. So what I'd like to do first is read a little snippet from Thich Nhat Hanh's book, Reconciliation. And then we have a video that's going to kind of drop us into a meditation where we get a chance to connect with the little one within. So from Thich Nhat Hanh, listening. When we speak of listening with compassion, we usually think of listening to someone else, but we must also listen to the wounded child inside of us. Sometimes the wounded child in us needs all of our attention. That little child might emerge from the depths of your consciousness and ask for your attention. If you are mindful, you can hear their voice calling for help. At that moment, instead of paying attention to whatever is in front of you, 
go back and tenderly embrace the wounded child. You can talk directly to the child with the language of love saying, in the past, I left you alone. I went away from you. Now I'm very sorry. I'm going to embrace you. You can say, darling, I am here for you. I will take good care of you. I know that you suffer so much. And I have been so busy. I have neglected you. And now I have learned a way to come back to you. If necessary, you have to cry together with the child. Whenever you need to, you can sit and breathe with the child. This is the, the breathing exercise that Thich Nhat Hanh recommends. Breathing in, I go back to my wounded child. Breathing out, I take good care of my wounded child. If you'd like to embody this practice fully, um, you're gonna see me on the beach in St. Petersburg, Florida doing child's pose, which is a beautiful yoga pose that just helps you connect with the inner child. And as we're here with all of our sea friends and land, sand land animals and seabirds, you can just assume child's pose if you'd like to embody this, or you can just drop into your own meditation. Just listen to the words of the song as you breathe in and out with your inner child. Breathing in, I go back to my inner child. Breathing out, I take good care of my inner child. No, you are loved. Dream your sweet dreams Till your soul is released Know you are loved Rest in peace Dream your sweet dreams Till your soul is released
other to come back to this meditation. If you happen to touch into a place with tears, you can just thank your inner child for communicating with you and uh, thank yourself for being the supportive adult for that inner being. It's this kind of compassionate practice that allows us to continue doing the compassion work we do in the world. So thank you for joining me in this practice. Thank you, Reverend Erica. And it is my pleasure today to introduce to you somebody that I already love. <laughs> That's always the most fun. And she is Reverend Lydia Houston, an ordained ACIM Course in Miracles minister in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. She's been a vegan for 20 years, and she is a graduate of the T. Colin Campbell Foundation for Nutrition Studies. And like Sue, our reader of the tenets, she's a Main Street Vegan certified vegan lifestyle coach and educator. She's a personal chef and one of my favorite people. Welcome, Reverend Lydia. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would like to start, Lydia, with just finding out a little bit about yourself. Were you the kind of kid that people thought would grow up to be ordained and vegan? Uh, actually, I think, yes, I was very... Uh, outside of the norm. <laughs> I grew up in the inner city and uh, lots of meat eating, um, dog fighting, uh, things that were very disturbing to me. Uh, I believe when I was in third grade, we went on a field trip to um, somewhere in Michigan. It was like a slaughter facility but we weren't allowed to see anything disturbing, but um, some boys were making fun of something and I wandered into a wrong area and saw something I never should have seen. And that really scarred me, but it shaped the person that I am today because I think that animals, it's, it's just a belief that I had then but it was later confirmed that animals are sentient beings and they have souls. They want to live. They want to avoid violence. They want to be loving to their community, to their families. Wow, when you described that Lydia and said that you shouldn't have been there I wondered if that was what Gautama, the Buddha, thought when he was seeing the, the suffering in the world for the mm -hmm. first time, and yet it led to beautiful teachings. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your spiritual path, how you got to A Course in Miracles. And for those who don't know about it, what is it? What are the basic tenets? Oh, my goodness. I could talk about A Course in Miracles forever. Um, but what led me to A Course in Miracles uh, was... Uh, a discipline that I began when I was 12. And, and when I was 12, it was the latter part of the 70s. And I guess I wandered into a bookstore and I found a book called Handbook to Higher Consciousness. I and, remember that one. <laughs> oh my God. It was, wasn't it back in the day? Okay, so uh, I read this and I thought, wow. These are the keys to life. And I became a devotee of everything that Ken Kais wrote. And I read all the books. But as I, as I grew up, I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't adhere to the 12 pathways in every situation. A trauma, um, violence. I just couldn't connect with it. I was scared in these situations. And I thought, you know, this isn't serving me completely. I mean, it's serving me in matters where um, I may be a little irritated or I might be angry about something, but fear, it didn't do a thing to it. I mean, and I thought, oh, wow. This doesn't work. And that realization made me afraid because I had devoted 
years of my life, over a decade to living this, these principles. And I didn't discover A Course in Miracles until I was actually teaching school. And I remember uh, I was in line at a Borders and a book, some, a book just fell off a shelf and hit me on the back of the head. And I thought, cause I was bent over picking up some books that I was trying to keep. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, what is this? And it was called The Disappearance of the Universe. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'll read it while I'm in this longer than long line. And it just enthralled me. And I asked my mom to get me A Course in Miracles for Christmas. And the rest is history because I connected so much with what the course actually teaches. And this is the main principle. Every single one of us, whether we are animal, um, whether we are non-human animals, um, we deserve God's love and compassion. And it doesn't make a difference if we are animal advocates or if we are murderers. We all deserve the same compassion and it's given to us freely by God. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to invoke it. It's just given to us, but we have to uncover all of the barriers that we place between us and God. And that's a great realization and that removes fear. I remember hearing Wayne Dyer quote from the course, which is not something that I've studied, but I do remember this quotation. He said, if you knew who walked beside you every moment of this life mm -hmm. that you have chosen, you could never be afraid. Mm -hmm. And often that that comes to me and I, I can just feel a peace just from that one line. Oh, yes. I love that. There are so many ACIM quotes that I love, but um, one of my favorites is the holiest of all the spots on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. Ooh. Can you do that one again? Yes. The holiest of all the spots on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. Whoa. Oh, yeah, that's so interesting that you would say that because William was telling me that he was going down Fifth Avenue yesterday and he saw that where there had been a statue of this terrible man from long ago, but not long enough, he was a, a doctor and he did experiments on women of color without their permission. Uh -huh. And somebody decided that there should be a statue of him. And it was taken down three or four years ago. And evidently now they have put a big like bag over it. Uh, so I don't know, maybe they're going to do something else with it or maybe. And I said, you know, that's cool. There should be a bag over it just so that people will say, what does that bag stand for? It stands for an ancient hatred. And maybe they can put some sort of memorial to, to a present love. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. So what does it mean to, to be a student of A Course in Miracles? How does it change how you live your day-to-day -day life? I guess there's a quote from uh, Disappearance of the Universe that says, um, life is just one thing after another. And with the <laughs> Course, it's just one thing after another. But when something calls for forgiveness, you do it. And how do we do that? You talked about your slaughterhouse experience as a little girl, and we know that that experience is going on mm -hmm. for animals day after day everywhere. How do we forgive not so much the people who are also abused by having to do that work, but the people who are profiting from it? Oh, that, oh, I, that's a really, really good question. And I'm glad you asked that <laughs> because the way all of us here look at animals, we see the Christ in them, their innocence, their love. I mean, it's not hard for us. And this is something that we have to trans, 
defer to the perpetrators because without seeing them with the eyes of Christ, we can't be saved and we can't save. So you've used the word Christ a few times, and I, I'm sure that's a real trigger word for a lot of people. So is A Course in Miracles Christian? Uh, actually, um, conventional Christians do not recognize the Course. No, they do not. Um, and this is not traditional Christianity. Um, I have to say that this is not a religion it's a spirituality that calls for so much more than dogma in fact there is no dogma there is only an experience and the experience is forgiveness but it's not a traditional christian definition of forgiveness because forgiveness in traditional christian terms means that you recognize someone did something wrong and you pardon them. In A Course in Miracles, we recognize that no one, no one is without innocence. And we have to see the innocence in them, which means we have to see beyond their actions. We have to see beyond what this human form seems to be doing to other human forms we have to look and we have to see the Christ in them. And that is asking a lot of all of us. But the course, it's a difficult path to follow, but it is so rewarding. It brings you such peace if you can really do it. So when you get up in the morning, um, what's your first thought every day? Oh, okay. My first thought is to put the Holy Spirit in charge of my day. Um, if it works, if you just take five minutes, it doesn't take like a whole hour of meditation, but five minutes of just connecting with the Holy Spirit and saying, you know, this is going to be a difficult day, or it's going to be a wonderful day, but I want you with me and guiding all of my thoughts and actions. And that helps a great deal, but it's just five minutes in the morning. So if somebody wanted to look into this book, and I'll just be completely upfront with you, I tried to read it <laughs> and it just, you know, it just didn't speak to me. And there was something in the very beginning when it said, you know, maybe you won't read this book today, but you know, you'll, you'll read this book someday, you know, and it's almost <laughs> like, with all the traditions and all of the wisdom from all the millennia, it just seemed kind of, um, well, kind of like some of the things we say about conventional religion that we're not mm -hmm. crazy about. <laughs> you know what? Uh, the text of A Course in Miracles is extremely difficult to get through. And I know exactly what you're saying. Um, this is, this book is just okay it's amazing for one thing but it is difficult the text is difficult to get through it is written almost entirely in shakespearean blank verse and this is not something that a lot of people want to connect with um but if you if you read if you read the text first it'll give you like the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles. But again, just the text is not, is not where you actually get the practice because the workbook, the workbook is really, really wonderful. And if you, if you have like some background about what the course is about, like say you read Disappearance of the Universe or one of Gary Renard's other books, you get a background of the text and maybe you can skip over the text and do the workbook because the workbook is 365 lessons, daily lessons. Although you can take more than a year to do it because sometimes I stayed on a lesson three or four days because it really spoke to me. And uh, sometimes I, you know, things were going on in the family and I took off a few days, you know, um, so it took me, it took me about a year and four months 
to get through the workbook, but it is so rewarding because it trains your mind to think in terms of forgiveness. And we don't just have to forgive the people that seem to treat us unfairly. We have to forgive situations we see on the news um, every day. It's, it's the kind of forgiveness that recognizes the illusory nature of the world and how we need to get back to what's real, which is God, heaven, everything that, that is saved for us. If we can just remove all the obstacles to the awareness of it. So when I look at your life and coming from a yoga Vedanta background as I do, I would call you a karma yogi. I mean, you are just in there doing the work every day. Your, your spirituality, as from an outside point of view, is the action, is, is the selfless service. So I know you have a lot of family obligations <laughs> and you, sh you show up. So, so talk to us about that. You know, it's one thing we can talk about all the philosophical stuff, but in the nitty gritty of the day and the to-do mm. list and what's expected, how do you bring your spirituality into that? In certain families, there will be a focal person who sort of tries to hold things together. That used to be me and it was draining. But when I found the course, it was no longer draining because I showed up in a different way. Um, it didn't seem difficult for me to uh, do the same things I did before the course, but now I'm doing it with the eyes of forgiveness, seeing innocence everywhere. No one's guilty, no matter what they've done, no matter how stressed it seems the situation is. Everyone's doing the best they can with the level of awareness they have. So um, I can show up and the course is a, it's a happy form of spirituality. So uh, you can laugh at life at how you know ridiculous things can be. Um, showing up, for instance, at my, my niece's funeral and we were all at the funeral home planning this somber event. And this was in Detroit. And I just remember thinking, gosh, Tia would really laugh at what's going on in the parking lot here. And uh, for a minute, I just couldn't go inside the funeral home because I had to take a moment to laugh with Tia, my deceased niece, because I thought this is just ridiculous that um, people are eating KFC like in the parking lot of a funeral home. And I thought, my God, this is, so I made it my duty to myself to find something humorous every single day. And sometimes it's, it's nothing more than an interesting meme on, <laughs> on social media or something, but I definitely find the laughter because the Course says laughter is of the Holy Spirit. When you can genuinely laugh at life and everything life seems to be doing to you, you have reached a place of innocence and you have found your way back. I love your repeated use of the term innocence. And you remind me of a line from one of my favorite movies, um, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. Oh, if you haven't yes. seen it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, I figured you would. Uh, 1969, Franco Zeffrelli, gorgeous movie about mm -hmm. St. Francis and, and St. Clair. Mm -hmm. And after a arduous journey people weren't liking what saint francis was doing and he said well he's going to go to the holy father and get it checked out so he makes his way to rome and he gets his audience with the pope mm -hmm. and everybody wants him kicked out <laughs> and the pope says we have gotten so concerned about original sin that we have forgotten original innocence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 
Yeah, and then I think about, you know, the Innocence Project that's uh, doing wonderful work in the world. What a great word, maybe a word to use more often. Mm -hmm. Innocent. I, and I've noticed on some of the court shows, they don't say innocent anymore. They just say not guilty. Whatever happened no, to what innocent? Is, what happened to that? <laughs> <laughs> they took the innocence right out of our judicial system. <laughs> So I want to ask you a kind of devil's advocate question, Lydia. We know that probably the best known proponent of uh, A Course in Miracles is Marianne Williamson, mm -hmm. who is not to date vegetarian, as, mm -hmm. as far as I know. And still, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so many other people who are involved in really forward thinking spiritual kinds of organizations they still eat animals i mean ugh. why why are people who are otherwise so open-minded so hard to reach with this message someone once told me that trying to change someone's diet is harder to do than to change their religion I mean, it is actually really difficult. And I know that I've been to a lot of ACIM conferences and the, the focus, a lot of the focus after all of the lectures and the great talks, the food. And it's really all you can eat and there are animal products flying here and there. And <laughs> um, I guess, when because the course the course teaches is not so much what happens out here or what we do as far as behavior but the way we think and a lot of people are disconnected from the suffering that actually goes in to preparing like delicious food that they're used to eating and so no one no one makes that connection too often, unless you came to ACIM already vegan, which I did. <laughs> um, it, it, I guess the, the point of view as far as ACIM is concerned is that if you're coming from a place of love, and we are all coming from a place of love, love for animals, love for life, love for other people and their suffering i guess that it's it can be difficult for people to actually say well i i'm very spiritual but i it doesn't matter what you eat because it it matters more what your what your spirit is or what you're thinking and your mind but actually I have to say that like being vegan, all of us, we have, it's our chosen path. It's, it is our chosen path and we need to act our parts with honor, no matter what's going on out there. But so I never really talked to anyone in ACIM or the Community Miracles Center where I was ordained. I never really talked to anyone about becoming vegan, but I just acted my part with honor and I was very vegan. So <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, something trickled off and, and, and people caught on. Um, but yeah, I, I do notice that like uh, when the reverends, all of the reverends who were ordained that day, we were all ordained like on my birthday, I think. Oh. And uh we went out to dinner. Oh, by the way, dinner was at a wonderful restaurant where uh, ex-convicts served us. Oh. It, was, it was really great. I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but I just remember, wow, this is really awesome. Where, where was that? Uh, San Francisco. Oh, cool. Because we have one in New York, which is also vegan. Uh, really? Yeah. Our compassion and action person, uh, April Tam Smith, is a co-owner. Uh, yeah. P.S. Oh. Kitchen. It says nonprofit restaurant. And I don't know if it's 100% of the staff, but a high percentage of the staff were either incarcerated or homeless 
prior. Oh my gosh. Okay, Victoria. Wonderful that's idea. Good. That's a date. We have to do that. Okay. 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 <laughs> That's, that's a promise then. So just really quickly before our time is up, I told you this would be quick. I, I just learned, you know, it's funny how you can know somebody for a long time. Like I knew that you were always making smoothies in the morning, mm -hmm. but lots of people make smoothies in the morning. <laughs> and I didn't know until this morning that um, you uh, follow the principles of the medical medium. Mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting spiritual slant on um, food and stuff. It is. So just tell us a little bit about how you eat and uh, what you drink. Okay. Uh, wow. This is okay. So in the morning I begin with uh, lemon water, like 32 ounces. And I know 32 ounces is a lot, but you can really drink 32 ounces, no matter how small you are. Um, Later on, I will shower, get dressed, you know, brush my hair, go back downstairs and juice celery. And I'll have 32 ounces of celery juice. Now, while I'm cleaning the celery juicer and doing other things like making my husband's breakfast, making breakfast for the dogs, I will make myself a smoothie. And the, the first smoothie I make is probably the liver rescue smoothie, which is really yummy. Uh, it's just uh, papaya, uh, dragon fruit, um, coconut water, and lots of blueberries. I think a heaping two cups of blueberries. And uh, I usually, I don't like the taste of um, papaya too much, so I usually just substitute bananas. But that's the first smoothie of the day and it's huge it's like 32 ounces so yeah that's <laughs> so uh i'm so full in the morning that i'm not hungry until lunchtime which i'll have the heavy metal detox smoothie for lunch which is probably why i never gain weight because those two meals are so filling but dinner i might you know i might just have steamed vegetables, steamed vegetables. And uh, sometimes I'll have millet bread, which I make um, from scratch or something like that, you know. So uh, I do avoid radical fats usually, but um, occasionally I will treat myself to some really good vegan chocolate. Uh, <laughs> It's well, okay. speaking, speaking of, of spiritual, sometimes there's nothing closer to God than a little vegan chocolate. Thank you so much, Reverend Lydia Houston. Yep. You are a light. <laughs> and passing it on to Reverend Erica and Compassion in Action. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks for ending us with some vegan chocolate. That's a nice way to end that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Lydia. All right, so we're at that moment where it's been just about an hour we've been gathered. You've probably been sitting for this amount of time. So I'm just going to invite you into your body a little bit. What needs to move? What needs to stretch? What needs to shake? What needs to contract and expand? I was When I was on the beach, I saw the most amazing seabirds, and they, they would just open their wings up and go flying. So feel free to be inspired by any of your favorite human or non other than human beings as you move around, just check in, what do you need? And when that feels good, go ahead and drop back in because we have a very exciting guest today in our Compassion in Action segment. And I think as you all know, this segment is really meant to highlight members of our community who are putting their compassion into action in their daily life. And we like to showcase people who are doing this because it inspires all of us and gives us all ideas of, of things we can do. And uh, so I'm very excited today to introduce you. Um, and this, this person I'm going to introduce, I could be talking to you about multiple things that uh, she's involved in, but we are gonna focus in on one particular um, facet of her compassion in action for this segment. So let me introduce you to Freya Dinshaw, she joined the American, she actually, she said to join the American Vegan Society in 1960, soon after its founding, and has been its president since 2000. She's the editor of American Vegan Magazine and the author of The Vegan Kitchen, the first American cookbook with vegan in its title, and that was in 1965. 
She has been a key organizer of national and local events to promote compassionate, healthful living. And the AVS, the American Vegan Society, recently opened its brick and mortar American Vegan Center in Old City, Pennsylvania, in order to draw attention to the rich vegetarian and vegan history of the area. You can learn more about the events and, and um, activities at the Welcome Center. And the big highlight, which is coming up next weekend, is the annual AVS, American Vegan Society Garden Party. That's on May 29th. And it's happening um, at the headquarters in New Jersey, which is near Philly. So that's the formal bio. Give away Freya. So nice for you to join us today. Hello, Erica. Hello, everyone. Pleased to be here. Yay. Um, so I also want to just mention that um, you have been 60 plus years on the vegan path. That's right. Yes. So this is this is remarkable. And the, the focus that we want to uh, look at today is a program that you started in schools with youth trying to help them learn how to do vegan cooking. And so before we dive in, I want to show some pictures because a picture is worth a thousand words. So let's get a few pictures up here. Let's see what this looks like in action. And then I want to hear some stories about what this program is, how you thought of it, how it happened. So uh, that is your book on the cover, the book that you created for the, the kids, yeah? Um, yes, that's the book that um, came out of the classes and the activities I was doing with children. And we involved quite a few kids in it um, from the after-school program, um, neighborhood kids, family kids, and so on. T take a look at these kids that Freya has been teaching. That, that, that adorable kid is making tofu salad, I believe, right? That's right, yes. One of the recipes from the book. We teach children to use knives and, and be safe in the kitchen. Uh, a lot of um, parents don't want their children in the kitchen. They think they'll be a nuisance. It'll take too long if the child's in the kitchen. And knives and things are dangerous. Well, I think it's very important to teach children how to use knives safely, because I see a lot of adults who don't know how to be safe in the kitchen. We introduce them to a lot of things that you know may become place to us, but in their surroundings, they don't um, have these foods. Uh, a lot of children have never had a date, and we just put a, a nut, a Brazil nut, in the center of a date and give it to them. They think it's marvelous. Um, these two pictures are um, on the right-hand side is my grandson, Clint. And uh, on the left-hand side is Nardos. Nardos is from Ethiopia and he joined our family three years ago. So last year they wanted to plant vegetables and this is uh, the result. They had quite crowded little gardens. We had to keep the deer out, which meant that just particularly Nardos's basil and beans were eaten a number of times by the deer before we managed to protect them enough so they could climb up. Amazing. I would love to just hear how did you get this idea? Like what inspired you to say, you know what, I think I'm going to go work with some kids and teach them how to cook in a vegan way. Well, this is one of those things that happened by chance. I was already volunteering to help at an after school program, help the children with their reading, help with their math. And then one evening, the lady who does their snacks said, um, it would be good if we could give them healthier snacks. So I said, well, I'd been thinking about that too. How would it be if we made a soup? We can find out what vegetables the children like and we'll make soup. So the children um, said what vegetables they liked. I got them together. And the next day they each took turns preparing vegetables to put in this big soup pot. And they loved it. Um, when their parents came to pick them up, we had plenty of soup, parents could share it. But, um, they were amazed to see their children enjoying vegetables. Yeah, probably not something they had seen at home very much. <laughs> probably not. So anyway, it, it went from there. I did it for about 10 years with that particular group. Wow. Sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, but um, it made quite an impression on it on them. I know at least two of them became vegan in the long run. Wow. How, how old are some of them now? Well, the age range at the center is from age about six to 18. Um, but I don't use the word vegan in this context because I know it might um, upset some people to think I'm trying to influence their kids to eat differently from the way they eat at home. So what I say is that we have a snack program based on foods that we are encouraged by the USDA to eat more of. So that means we 
we work with fresh vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and we introduce them to the legumes, the peas, beans, and lentils. So with the program, we do quite a bit of um, salads and soups and also some treats. And you know, we make cookies sometimes and we make cakes sometimes. And they really love it. In fact, after an evening with them, I'm on quite a high when I get home and you know, so surprised and delighted that they enjoyed things so much. So amazing. And what would you say to people who are listening to this and thinking like, oh, I should, I should see if I can do something similar in my local community. What, like, what would they need to know in order to do something like this that, that you've learned over time? Well, I, I've done it by invitation. I was subsequently asked by a church group to go and um, give a series of classes down there. And um, I don't know whether it's, whether you, <laughs> I don't know whether I would have been able to have the hoots about to go in and say, let me do it, but I got invited to do it and it went very well. Well, now there's a model that you've put out in the world that other people yes. can point to and say, look, you should let me do this in, in our local community because it's working over there. If, if someone else recommends you, that's the best way to Fabulous. do it. Fabulous. But and what's your- A lot of energy for this. If they've been involved in preparing food themselves, they really want to try it. And one of the key things is not to have other foods that um, they're used to and might choose to eat in preference. You know, so we don't have a lot of chips and things of that sort. But um, right. it's worked, worked out very well and a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful work. And is there anything you want to say just about the Garden Party or the American Vegan Society while, while we've got you here on the screen? Well, it'd be lovely if some of you can come to the Garden Party. We do expect to videotape it, so there will be some um, something to see afterwards. We're very fortunate that Dr. Michael Clapper is coming to speak. In fact, we've had to postpone this uh, garden party for two years on account of COVID, but every year Michael says he'll come and he will be here. And so Michael is one speaker and I am the other speaker and I'll be talking about my 60 years of being a vegan. Amazing, amazing. And I just wanna uh, call out, Victoria wrote a comment in the chat. I'm gonna read it out loud because it's such a beautiful comment. The American Vegan Society and Freya and her, and her late husband, Jay, believed in me until I could believe in myself. They carried the torch of ahimsa and vegetarianism and veganism before anyone in this country had even heard of it. So that's massive. It's a massive tribute to you. Thank you for the, the, the pathways you've paved for, for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. All right. I, I remember typing letters to you when my daughter, Anne, was just a little kid, and she typed all the X's on the bottom of the letter. Amazing. <laughs> I remember those too. <laughs> we've, got some, we've got some pretty profound history in this community. So it's so beautiful. So yes, thank you so much, uh, Freya, for joining us and Victoria for, for um, inviting Freya to be a part of this. And we hope you're all inspired now by a little more compassion in action and, and have some new ideas for what you might be able to do in your local place. So over to you, Rev. Sarah. Thank you. I'm very inspired by all that great food. I'm a notorious vegan junk food eater. And so I think that one of the highlights of being in this community for me is, is listening to what you are all eating. Um, Freya, seeing what you're teaching. And Lydia, ah, you've got me really interested in some of those shakes. You know, this is the first community I ever ever been involved in, spiritual community, where I'm hungry after I leave. <laughs> in a good way in a good way so today for our blessings and prayers as we transition into that space i'd like to thank another uh person within our community heather chase who teed up today's practice uh, she recently emailed us an excellent dharma talk which was titled the weight of the world is love the transforming power of compassion that she liked and i'll pop that link into the chat after the practice today um, but as, as I was looking at that, knowing Lydia would talk about forgiveness and not knowing that Erica would talk about breath, but apparently we're cosmically linked, who knows, um, I started to think about the practice of Tonglen, which was, is a Buddhist practice that is popularized in the States here by Pema Chandran, uh, Chodron, uh, if anyone is familiar with Pema's work. 
uh, and is comprised of sending and taking. So similar to the way that Erica had us breathing in and breathing out for our inner child, we're going to take that and expand that, that same type of breath, the idea of coming in and going out. When we breathe in, we'll be taking in pain, which sounds a little like scary sometimes to people. I don't want to take in pain, but we're bringing it in to transform it and we're breathing out peace and relief. We're breathing in the yuck and out the yum, I like to say, in the yuck, out the yum. So I'm going to ask you to take a, take a couple breaths as we transition from listening and smiling and hearing into stillness and becoming openness. Just let yourself settle. Notice the breath coming in and out of your body. Remember that you have a body. And as we breathe, we're going to first focus on texture. Not thoughts, but texture. So we're going to breathe in heat, darkness, heaviness. Breathe out lightness, openness, positivity. Breathe in heat, breathe out cool. Breathe in heavy. Without light. Now think of something that might be painful for you. It might be something that you heard today in the service, or something that you've been wrestling with, a situation in your home, a situation outside your home. It could be very personal or it could be systemic, if something painful to you. Then rather than giving it our prayers today, I'm going to ask you to breathe in the pain, confusion, the frustration, and breathe out care, compassion, forgiveness. Breathe in anger, breathe out peace. We'll stay here for a few breaths. Now think of someone in the world who is suffering, someone in your circle who needs healing, someone who's in pain, someone you care for. And do this on behalf of them. Breathe in their pain. Breathe out healing. You might even think about this in the context of Lydia's talk today. 
doing this on behalf of perpetrators of violence that we find hard to relate to. Breathing in the pain they must feel. Breathing in what causes them to act in such ways. And breathing out peace to them, healing to them. And now I'll ask Phil as a final step to open the chat wide open for everyone. Knowing that some of us love words. <laughs> so in addition to this breath in and out, if there's anyone, anything you would like witnessed in this community, if there was an, anyone you'd like to ask for, prayer blessings or good vibes or whatever wording is comfortable for you, please feel free to enter that into the chat. I have one on a happy note, and I mean that very, very tongue in cheek. Prayers for Happy the Elephant, whose case was heard Wednesday at the New York Court of Appeals. And thanks to the Non-Human Rights Project for their ongoing work to get personhood and more laws for other than human animals. And for the dog next to Victoria, who's often left alone, To an upstairs neighbor who's suffering great pain to all of these feel free to keep those coming in the chat as Phil raises for us our final closing prayer. Well, if you could bring up slide I don't know maybe five or so the technicolor beautiful blessing Ah, uh, there we go. So for everything we breathed in and out and for all of the words that we see in the chat, everything in this community is witnessing together, we offer these words. May all creatures everywhere be happy and free. May the thoughts, words, and actions of our lives contribute to this happiness and this freedom for all. May it be so. Amen, amen, so mote it be. Whatever words you'd like to close with from your tradition, feel free to say them to yourself. And I will make sure to put the Dharma talk in here as well. Here we go. We love, like, uh, like we've said earlier in the service, we love when you send us recommendations and things that you have. Thank you so much for Heather, who has a lot of great ideas. So please keep them going. Compassionconsortium at gmail.com. All right, William, I think you've got some slide announcements to slide into. Oh, see what I did there? Slide into the announcements. Thank you for joining us today. And I just want to let you know about what's coming up, because I think they're really, really good. So we're going to have next month at our Sunday service on June 26th, our special guest, Nathaniel Altman. He is a member of the Theosophical Society of America since 1970. And um, he is also the author or co-author of over 20 books on holistic health compassion, spiritual healing, palmistry, nature, and other metaphysical subjects. So two of his books that I have read, which I really enjoyed, are The Nonviolent Revolution, A Comprehensive Guide to Ahimsa, and The Spiritual Tool Chest, A Treasury of Meditations, Prayers and Blessings, and Ahimsa Dynamic Confession. So please, if you can, join us for that. That is going to be on June 26th. And then also, another person whom I know personally and, have, and, and very excited about is Jasmine Singer. Jasmine will join us on June 14th at 8 p.m. 
Eastern time for our celebration of Compassionate Book Night. And she is a worldwide leading expert on veganism and a very, very well-known speaker on topics including radical body positivity, personal narrative as a means of social justice, and how to change the world for animals. She's the author of The Veg News Guide to Being a Fabulous Vegan, and Always Too Much and Never Enough, a memoir. And also, she is the co-host of the long-running Our Hen House podcast, um, which is an award-winning show that centers around animal rights. So, so if you enjoyed our service, please, we would encourage you to donate on our website. We have a link that will be posted in the chat box. And for our engaged members, we will have our monthly June engaged practice circle on June 20th. And this will be led by Victoria and will focus on your vision of a vegan world based upon a reading of Isaiah's prophecies. And then also, you know, check out our membership program. Uh, all the details are there. It, and I think the, um, Link is in the uh, chat box. Uh, so, you know, please consider joining, joining us as a member. And then lastly, I just want to one more time mention our animal chaplaincy training program. And so you can check that out on our website and the details are in the chat box. Goodbye for now. And we will see you next month Thank you for coming to Compassion Consortium's Sunday service. We will see you in June.